Hi, I'm Al Cobb. Welcome to the first hour of 10 hours of Builder Education Training, referred to as BEST, Builder Education with SIPS Training. In the first hour, we're going to go through the introduction of SIPS. This is going to be a broad overview of the SIP industry, kind of how it got started, and where it stands today. The learning objectives that we have in this first hour, in a rough order, will include the background of SIPS, how they got started, how long ago, back in the 30s, when this concept of SIPS first started, what forces influenced the growth of SIPS, and how they got to where they are today, what effect other areas of the industry have had on SIPS, and how that has played in the growth and acceptance of SIPS. We're going to talk about SIPA, the Structural Insulated Panel Association, how it was formed, why it was formed, what the mission statement and what we hope to accomplish with the best program in order to promote SIPS and increase the use of SIPS in the building industry today. We're going to review the manufacturing process of SIPS so that you have a clear understanding of the basics of how SIPs are manufactured, the different types of SIPs, the processes that they go through in terms of foam manufacturing, as well as the lamination process, pressing, and fabrication. So you have a clear understanding of how these different types of SIPs are in fact manufactured. SIPs have been around for a long time. Some people don't realize that, and they think as a new technology, therefore it's unproven, and they may not be inclined to accept the use of SIPs in their particular project. The reality is the SIPs have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, they're not new to the building industry. Some of the earliest pioneers started thinking about and working with SIPs and SIP technology back in early as the 30s. If we go back to lamination technology, it goes back many hundreds of years before that. The combination of certain substrates laminated together it's what really gives us that structural insulated panel. Now the history of SIPS started when the Forest Products Lab, located up in Wisconsin, started to think about a combination of natural resources and the effective or the efficient uses of these resources. We grow a lot of trees in North America and we want to use them effectively or efficiently. So the Forest Products Laboratory started to look at different ways to use technologies that more efficiently used our most abundant natural resource. Frank Lloyd Wright, in some of the earliest designs that he built back in the late 30s and the 40s, used the concept of a structural insulated panel. But it was in fact one of his students by the name of Alden B. Dow, who is largely credited as the first inventor or manufacturer of a true structural insulated panel that took the technologies and the ideas that the Forest Product Laboratory created and laminated together a core with two substrates and created the first SIP. And this was done in about the late 30s, early 40s. Those products that he laminated were actually used in structures and some of those structures still stand today. So the history of SIPs and the technology that's gone into them has been around for 50, 60 years. And that technology has only improved as the industry has grown and matured. And I promise you we're not using the same substrates, we're not using the same adhesives, and we're not using the same foams as we did back then. So we've just continually to improve the process both in manufacturing and the technology that goes into manufacturing these projects. At the same time the SIP industry was starting to grow by very few people, along came another building technology that started to be looked at as a viable technology for building residential construction. And it was timber framing. The timber framing is an age-old technique of using mortise um, and tenon joinery. And this mortise and tenon joinery is used to create beautiful structures. And the timber framers, starting on about the 60s and 70s, realized that the best way to enclose these timber frames and add strength to the frame, as well as to efficiently wrap it in an envelope that was incredibly energy efficient, was to turn to the SIP industry. So the combination of this age-old craft of timber framing combined with the new age technology of SIPs worked together to give us a, a shell or an envelope around the timber frame that performed incredibly well. It was the timber framing industry that is largely responsible for the acceptance of SIPs and their technology into residential construction today. This association is a trade association much like any others. It was formed in the early 90s by a whole group of various manufacturers. 
And like any trade association, it has a mission statement. And the mission statement of SIPA is to increase the use and acceptance of SIPs to make it a green and high performing building product that um, uh, is used within the industry. They as an association increase communication, promotion, they provide market research and technical research as well. Their vision statement is that SIPs will be the preferred green building system. So it is the association's goal to take SIPs, push it into the mainstream even further than it is today and make it the preferred system that we're going to build houses with in the future. SIPA has a variety of different members within the association. At the top, you might say that it's the manufacturers, the different manufacturers that work in producing or manufacturing structural insulated panels. Like any association, we have vendor suppliers, we have a whole array of dealer distributors, architects, builders, and other various types of memberships. And hopefully it's you out there that are the builders uh, getting this type of training that as members of SIPA, if you're not already a member, you should certainly be looking at that, uh, and how the association can help you grow your business um, by doing things like this training, an educational opportunity. SIPA is very involved in the building trades and community, and in that fashion, they provide a whole array of news, industry news that has to do with SIPs. How are SIPs growing? Where are the stumbling blocks? How can we move through those stumbling blocks and increase their acceptance and just promote their use? They have national marketing campaigns. We have a variety of committees within the association, and those committees work in everything from marketing to technical research to legislation to liaisons with other building industries and trade groups. Uh, code acceptance is a very large one within SIPA. Uh, understanding how the code is constantly changing and how you have to be in ahead of time in order to affect real change years ahead as the code moves up and up and it starts to look at energy efficiency and things like that and how SIPs can play into those code acceptances. Uh, the prescriptive method, which is what SIPA moved forward uh, in a big way to promote, uh, was finally adopted in a supplement of the 2007 code uh, for the IRC. So the IRC now recognizes the fact that SIPs are part of the code. Your building inspector has the opportunity to come out, open up his manual, and literally read what SIPs do how they have to be used and can follow that prescriptive method in order to create um, a house that's durable and structurally sound. As the SIP industry continued to grow, the next big thing that created very, very large changes in acceptance of SIPs were technical issues. One came from the machine industry and the other came from the OSB industry. From the machine side, we had companies that were importing very highly sophisticated equipment that was using CNC technology, computer numeric control. Now back in the 90s there was not a single CNC cutting fabrication machine that was used in the production environment of manufacturing SIPs. It was all hand cutting. It was carpenters snapping lines and pulling out a saw and cutting it and trying to get the best yield and the best tolerances that you could get using the tools that we had. But with the technology advances that we've seen in CNC cutting, now we can combine the computer aided drawing right into computer aided manufacturing and these CNC capabilities have created a, a huge growth in potential and also driven the price of SIPs down because the fabrication has increased in terms of its efficiency. At the same time the OSB industry, Oriented Strand Board, which has largely taken over a huge market share of the plywood industry, has grown their technologies and allowed them to create what we refer to as jumbo size OSB. Now the jumbo format of OSB is an 8 by 24 foot sheet. If we can build a SIP that's 8 by 24 feet, unlike what was built back in the 30s and 40s using standard 4 by 8 plywood, we now have 192 square feet of panel. And that 192 square feet of panel, or 8 by 24 foot panel, allows us to do things that we only talked about previously, and that is we put up buildings quicker we have fewer joints, we have fewer potential problems, we can design in different ways and formats that allow us to make um, buildings that, that can conform to the designs that we're trying to build. So it's this large format technology that the OSB industry introduced in the 90s was a huge leap forward for the SIP industry. The latest thing to really influence the SIP industry has been what I like to call the perfect storm 
or also known as the Green Revolution. You can't walk into a trade show today and not read um, everybody touting their product is a green product or a product that has energy efficient claims. Well, in the SIP industry, we've known this all along. Uh, we've always been green. We were green before green was really chic. We were energy efficient before people were thinking about energy efficiency. But now, the green revolution and the combination of a whole bunch of outside influences have all come together in the perfect storm to grow the SIP industry. And what are these things I'm talking about? I'm talking about the USGBC's LEED program, the fact that various municipalities and code bodies and officials are adapting these rating systems that demand the performance of structures and buildings so that they operate at a level of energy efficiency that we really didn't care about years ago. It's not just the USBGC LEED program, but you also have Earthcraft. You have other types of Energy Star program, Green Globes, various types of rating programs that are all being used by builders around the country and even overseas to build better buildings and make them more energy efficient. At the same time, we've got the government getting their hands in it in the terms of tax credits. Well, tax credits are a great thing. And these tax credits are the incentive. They're the carrot that is held out there to build better buildings. And not just better buildings and durable and sustainable buildings, but energy efficient buildings. And it's the energy efficiency that everybody is really keen in on right now. And it's the energy efficiency that, of course, we in the SIP industry know we can deliver time and time again with a SIP envelope that's properly installed. Global warming. Well, here's a huge thing that everybody's concerned about. And regardless of what you believe, um, energy efficiency can affect those types of philosophies of global warming or concerns about carbon. So it's all these things that have all come together that we look at from our industry, the SIP industry, and say, hey, we've already, we're already taking care of it. We're already there and we're doing this. We're giving you the points that you need for a rating system. We're giving you the energy efficiency that you desire. We're giving you the performance that allows you to get a tax credit and take advantage of all of these things that have come together in this perfect storm of green and energy efficiency. Okay, let's get into the anatomy of a SIP. What really is a structural insulated panel and how is it made up? Usually it's three components. It's the outside skin, the inside core, and the adhesive that holds them together. So let's start talking about the different types of facings that we see in the industry. Now, not all manufacturers provide and install or provide and manufacture with all types of facings. Uh, some do just one, some do a variety of them. It really depends, it's manufacturer specific. But if we look at the whole industry and the variety of facings that are offered, first and foremost, it's OSB, oriented strand board. It's about 80% of the industry. When you look at res and non-res alike, the entire amount of square footage that's manufactured within the industry, it's manufactured with an oriented strand board skin. There's some advantages and there's some disadvantages. The oriented strand board that's used, as I had said before, is manufactured up to an 8 by 24 feet, and in some cases a little larger than that. But the 8 by 24 is what we're going to refer to as a jumbo panel. Now the OSB is an exposure one rated product. It has the ability to get wet and if it dries back out, there's no harm, no foul. It's perfectly good and has a, a perfectly good service life. OSB is a nice product in that it's uh, understood by most carpenters or most builders. They're used to working with wood. Now in some areas of the country, dealing with wood is a disadvantage. You don't want it for a variety of reasons. And in those areas, that's where using a metal skin SIP may make sense. Metal has the ability to be laminated directly to foam. It makes up kind of a small portion of the market considering OSB is 80% of the market. Our metal portion of the market is only about 10 to 15% of the market. Um, it first started actually when manufacturing panels for the freezer or the walk-in cooler industry. They would take a foam core and laminate metal to it. You had a finished skin on both sides and that's what we use to make large walk-in coolers or freezers but it has since graduated to be used in the regular residential and non-residential um, structural insulated panel industry. The metal uh, typically will come in a much narrower width. It comes on coil stock and roll, so therefore you can roll out a long coil and you can have a panel as long as 53 feet. If you can fit it on the back of a flatbed truck, you can roll it down the road, and that's fine, but it's going to be a lot narrower. So that's uh, one of the comparisons when you look at OSB. 
The third and still even smaller portion in North America is going to be the concrete or the cementaceous skin. The cementaceous skin is a concrete impregnated skin that typically comes in a 4 by 8 sheet. In some cases you can get it up to about a 4 by 12, maybe as high as a 4 by 14. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages there as well. Um, but it, again, it's a small portion of the market. The other types of skins that we can put on might be a finished cladding or a finished material. Now there are some real disadvantages in some cases when you're putting a finished skin on the outside of a sip, but we'll talk about that later when we can compare all of the various types of products. It's to say that you can put a finished clad directly on the outside of a, of a panel so that once it's installed, you don't have to do anything else to it. So those are the facings that we have on a sip. Now let's talk about the cores. There's basically three different types of cores in the industry. Just as OSB makes up about 80% of the market for, uh, for the outside facings, EPS makes up about 80% of the panels in terms of the core of the panel. It's this EPS, which is expanded polystyrene, that is used as the rigid foam in between those two facings. So what is EPS? Expanded polystyrene is the white foam. Most people know the white foam and they may inadvertently refer to it as styrofoam when they talk about give me a styrofoam coffee cup, but in fact that white foam is expanded polystyrene. And expanded polystyrene is quite a bit different than styrofoam because that's the second type of core material that we might have and that's XPS or extruded polystyrene. We're still using styrene, but instead of expanding it into a block, we extrude it into board stock and then laminate it. The third core type is polyurethane. Now, some people may refer to it as polyisocyanurate, but in fact, the chemical and physical properties differ between polyisocyanurate and polyurethane. The manufacturers in North America, and for the most part around the world, manufacturing SIPs use polyurethane. This polyurethane, when it's used as the core material, changes the game a little bit in that the anatomy of the SIP no longer includes three products, it only includes two. Because polyurethane in the manufacturing process, which you'll see in a moment, expands and adheres itself to the skin. So we don't have a third component, which is a glue line. The polyurethane expanded foam is, in fact, its own glue. So there's your rigid insulation types, EPS, XPS and polyurethane. We refer to them in an abbreviated form as EPS, XPS, and PU. Okay, sometimes we'll just refer to it as urethane or polyurethane, but also known as PU. If we move away from the facings and the core, what's left is a glue line. If we're laminating the EPS or the XPS, we need a glue line, and that has to be in a, a structurally um, uh, engineered glue line that attaches these components together. Now we use engineered glue in a lot of variety of industries. If you're a builder and watching this, hopefully you've used eye joists, paralams, glue lambs, LVLs, all types of these engineered wood components are wood strands or wood particle pieces that are laminated together using an engineer grade adhesive. It's these adhesives that we also use in laminating a SIP together. There's basically two different types of adhesives that we can use. One is a two-part water-based adhesive, and the other one is a moisture-cured urethane adhesive. Moisture-cured urethane, you may know as the uh, bottled adhesive that's referred to as Gorilla, Gru Gorilla Glue. That urethane adhesive depends on moisture that is sprayed during the manufacturing process to create the chemical change which creates the bond and you're going to see that shortly when we go through the manufacturing process of these SIPs. So now we have all of the components of the SIP and we go from the anatomy of a SIP to where do we use SIPs. If you've been using SIPs in the past you may know that we can use them in a whole variety of different locations whatever is the envelope of the structure floors, walls, or roof. If we start with floors and look at those just the floor component for a while, what we see is that SIPs can be used in a floor, but quite frequently they are not for a variety of really good reasons. In fact, only about 2%, maybe 3% of all SIPs that are manufactured actually end up in a floor. The areas that it may make sense to use SIPs in a floor is when we're over top of completely unconditioned space. Now when I say unconditioned space, I'm not referring to a basement or even a crawl space. 
if it's up to me as a builder, all my crawl spaces are always going to be conditioned. If we do use SIPs in a floor and we're over an unconditioned space, for instance, if we're on the side of a mountain or a ski slope up on top of pilings, or better yet, we're at the beach, we're up on top of pilings to get us up above any of the wave action, we now have Mother Nature blowing wind underneath of this structure. And when that wind and, and foul weather blows underneath our structure, this is when using SIP in a floor system starts to make sense. The SIP has a limited capacity to span certain distances when you start comparing it to the engineered wood systems that are commonly used by builders today. So it's the support structure that holds these floor panels up that you may need to increase, bulk up, so that the SIP floor panel actually works. If you are using it as a floor, as a floor system, it does work very well. It gives you the insulation. It doesn't squeak. It has the strength necessary when, by design, it's put in properly. Um, but some of the disadvantages of using SIPs in the floor is floors are flat. They collect water. If we're using a SIP that uh, is a wood skin and we then, or during the construction process, have to deal with inclement weather and rain, then that water is going to soak up on the floor and it can potentially cause harmful effects to that panel by getting it wet. When we talk about OSB, again, we are using an exposure one rated product that has the ability to get wet, but then also has to dry out. And when we use SIPs on the floor, especially in a rainy environment, or in a time of year where we have to deal with bad weather, it's sometimes not the best idea. The one other disadvantage of a SIP on a floor, again, most all of the skins that we can look at have a point load uh, resistance that is it's got a limitation. So now if we have a, a, a high heel that has a point load right on that OSB skin, it can potentially puncture that skin. How do we overcome this? We put down another layer of OSB or another layer of sheathing or tiling or something else, but not just a vinyl floor laminate over OSB because now we have not overcome that resistance to point load puncture. And if we do this, we may solve one problem but create another. With a second layer of sheathing over top of the floor panel, we now have a skin on top of a skin in terms of two layers, and that's one more area where moisture can collect, gather, trap, and have a much more difficult time in drying out. For this reason, I look really hard when specifying or designing in SIPs in a floor system. They're not always the best choice, and a lot of that is weather dependent, and again, whether or not we have Mother Nature blowing underneath of our structure. As we move away from floors, we next look at the vertical planes. The vertical planes, of course, are the walls of a structure. SIPs work very well for any type of design in terms of the walls. Why? Because they perform the way we want them to perform. They have the strength to be able to handle the design. We start looking at the structural loads applied to a building, and we have lateral forces and axial forces, the racking of the walls. Well, the SIPs are very, very strong. Um, and we'll go over the strength of SIPs when we start talking about design and engineering of the SIPs. But let's just say that right now, if you can design a structure and build it with sticks, I can build the exact same structure using a structural insulated panel. The opposite might not be able to, might not be true. Because of the inherent strength of a SIP, it can do things that a stick frame structure just can't do. And again, we'll talk about the engineering and the structural properties of those SIPs when we get into future chapters. But let's just say that the SIP walls, whatever the design, we can use SIPs. We can use a variety of thicknesses to achieve different thermal efficiencies and performance levels. Um, when properly designed, the SIP walls go up very, very quickly. They are very, very straight. We don't have the movement or the, the sway and the bowing that we sometimes see in stick frame or other constructions. So we get that good, tight envelope that goes up very, very fast. Now when we start talking about roofs, this is where SIPs in some cases shine the brightest. If you have a design that has that open vaulted or the cathedral ceiling, this is the perfect opportunity to incorporate SIPs such that we now take the insulation and we move it up into the plane of the roof. We're no longer having our insulation down at the ceiling line, but we're up at the roof line. Now we have a conditioned attic. And we have to start thinking about things like unventilated attic spaces. But again, we're going to talk about that when we get into the building science chapter, and again, talking about ventilated roofs and other subsystems. At this point, we use SIPs on roofs. They work very well when our design gives us that open vaulted uh, cathedral type design and 
It gives us all of our insulation, all of our structure that we need. We can span panels in either direction. Again, that's all of a design function. And this is where uh, you'll see a great number of SIPs used. Some people would say that SIPs work fine in roofs until the roof gets too complicated. I think you're going to see some pictures that would suggest uh, maybe that's not true. Because with computer-aided design, design in the 3D formats, and then going to computer numeric control cutting, we have the ability to take very complex joinery, um, complex designs, and make them work in a CAD environment, which is replicated in a computer cutted, cutting machinery, such that when it gets in the field, we can put together incredibly complex roof joinery. So now I'd like to go through the manufacturing processes. And we're going to start out with the manufacturing process of EPS. That's expanded polystyrene. EPS starts out looking like sugar or salt. It's just a bead. And inside that bead, it has a blowing agent, like all foams have. It has a blowing agent. The blowing agent in EPS is pentane gas. Now, pentane gas is a volatile organic compound, something that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about things like indoor air quality. This blowing agent is released when it's heated. EPS goes through a two-step process. It starts out in a pre-expander where we expand the bead to control the density of the foam by applying steam. The bead expands a certain amount, then it goes through an aging process for a few hours or a few days where it then goes back into a mold. EPS, when it comes out of a mold, the manufacturer is referred to as a block molder. It's this large block of foam that might be in a dimension of something in the neighborhood of three feet by four feet and 16 feet long, gives us this large block of foam from which we can now cut the cores. We can cut the cores or cut this block of foam down to whatever thickness we want to create the proper dimension of the finished structural slated panel. Now how do we cut this foam? Because EPS is a thermoplastic, it melts. Now some people would say that's a bad thing, others would say it's a good thing. Regardless, the manufacturing process and the modification of EPS panels allows the melting process of EPS to be used to our advantage. When we slab foam down, we can simply take a wire, typically it's a nichrome wire that's heated, and it's that wire that slices through the EPS just like a hot knife slices through butter. We now have a finished slab thickness, and it's this core that in the manufacturing process of panels then goes through a laminator or a roll coater or a bead applicator. Anything that applies the glue in a controlled amount, controlled quantity, typically in grams per square inch or grams per square foot, that applies it to the core. And then when the core uh, panel goes through the roll coater, it's stacked up in some form between the finish or the facings. Now we have different types of presses in various types of uh, uh, manufacturing facilities. Anything from a bag press, which uses vacuum, uh, because when we suck out all of the air in this bag, atmospheric pressure takes over and we have a controlled pressure to keep everything clamped together until the glue adheres or bonds, cures, if you will. Other types of presses include hydraulic, pneumatic. It's nothing more than taking this whole stack of what might be referred to as Oreo cookies with that white foam filling in the middle and we put enough pressure on there in terms of number of pounds per square inch such that it holds it in place and we now have a finished panel that can come out of the press in anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Other types of presses include continuous presses where we might only stack one press or lay up one panel at a time and then press that one panel at a time. It's these continuous lamination processes that we're starting to see come online that have resulted in production capabilities in some plants that's just mind-boggling. We can put out tens of thousands of square feet of panels in a one eight-hour shift because of the ability to lay down adhesive very, very quickly and an adhesive that reacts very quickly and then run through the press cycle on a, on a steady state. Um, some manufacturing process right now would actually result in an 8 by 24 foot jumbo panel coming out of that press line about every four to five minutes. And that's a lot of square footage moving through very, very quickly. Moving away from EPS, we now go to XPS, the extruded polystyrene. This is where we can use the term styrofoam. It's one form of XPS. Styrofoam is the blue material. Owens Corning makes a pink 
XPS material, and this material is the same styrene, but instead of molding it into a block, it's extruded. Extruding means that we mix the material and then it's forced through a dye. And this dye, when the material is squeezed out and dried, that material then uh, gives you board stock. It's this board stock that is used from there exactly as the EPS was used when we started applying the adhesive and going into a press. So we take this board stock, apply that glue, put it right back into the press. The differentiation between EPS and XPS is the XPS has a maximum thickness. So in some cases we have multiple glue lines. It depends on the thickness of the panel that we want to create. If we start talking about manufacturing a polyurethane, it's a different process altogether. And there are basically two different ways to manufacture a polyurethane panel. We can do it in a continuous line, or we can do it as a batch process. In a continuous line, what we have is the two components of polyurethane, which is polyol and the iso, or the isocyanurate material, which mixes together as A and B components, much like you might mix an epoxy A and B component together. It's these components in a very fine chemistry um, calculation determining how much material we'd need in each with the right um, uh, calculations for humidity and then temperatures. And these components are deposited between the two skins. And in a, in a continuous press, you'll see the OSB move through the press line with the A and the B component injected between the two skins and then as that foam expands it comes in contact with the OSB, adheres to it, and gives you that finished panel. The other way to do it is through batch injection. In batch injection the manufacturer actually builds the panel, whatever size that panel might be, 4x8 up to a 4x24 let's say. Then in the process they calculate the volume inside that panel. How much foam do they need to fill up the panel that they've just created? They then batch inject the correct amount of volume of foam. It expands, fills the volume inside, grows and adheres to everything that you have, and now you have a finished panel. So those are the two methods that we're going to use. Again, there's two components, the polyol and the isocyanurate that mix together. Now what I would like to do is take some time and start comparing the physical properties of different components. Let's start with the core materials. Remember I said we had three different core materials. That's EPS, XPS, and polyurethane. Well they all have slightly different different characteristics or physical properties. And again, let's stick with the facts. Let's leave the salesman's rhetoric out of this and talk about how they really perform and what the true facts of the performance values are. We're going to start with our value. Everybody thinks about our value as the end-all be-all or the requirement for what we need to be concerned about when we talk about energy efficiency. As a SIP builder, hopefully you understand and believe that it's just as much about air tightness as it is about R-value. But we have to understand what the R-value is, so let's talk about these three different types of foam. EPS, the R-value, is roughly at about four per inch. That's per inch of foam, you have an R-value of four. If we go to XPS, it jumps up a number. We're at about five per inch. If we go to polyurethane, we jump up again up to about 6.5. Now, it's at this point that we need to bring up the term off-gassing. But before we talk about off-gassing, let's make sure that we understand there's two forms of off-gassing. The off-gassing that most people think of is what might be referred to as that new car smell or carpet smell, the odor that you get off of a product that is off-gassing and affects things like indoor air quality. We're not talking about that type of off-gassing. We're talking about off-gassing as it relates to the blowing agent. Remember we talked about the blowing agent in EPS and it was pentane gas. Well, the other types of foams also have blowing agents. The polyurethane has a blowing agent which years ago was actually a CFC, a chlorofluorocarbon. Chlorofluorocarbons were outlawed in the 90s and they had to replace that with a hydrochlorofluorocarbon hydrochlorofluorocarbon. Now we've moved one step for, further and we're now using a blowing agent which is the 245FA. This 245FA is a non-ozone depleting blowing agent which is a great thing. This material um, finds itself trapped into the closed cell structure of the polyurethane foam. As part of the blowing agent it gets trapped in this cell structure, the closed cell nature of the foam. 
Over time, that blowing agent, which gives it an artificially high R value when it's first manufactured, somewhere above seven and even as high as eight per inch, that blowing agent bleeds out of the cell structure and in the world of insulation, this is known as off-gassing because the gas, which is the blowing agent, bleeds out and that decrease in blowing agent causes the R value to drift down. You may have heard of the term thermal drift. Well, thermal drift refers to the off-gassing that is seen in polyurethane foams. We start with an arbitrarily high number. Over time, that starts to dip down. The aged R value or the steady state R value that we really want to know and understand and work with in our design is going to be at that 6.5. In some cases, it's 6.6, .6, but it, it roughly is in that area. So you've got three different R values. The R value in the EPS is stable. It's always going to be there at 4. The XPS is relatively stable at about 5. And the polyurethane has a stable R value at about 6.5. And that's the R value facts of the foam cores. After we talk about R value, we're going to drop into compressive strength. Well, compressive strength is as much about density as it is anything. Again, let's start with EPS. EPS has a density that's controlled in the manufacturing process through the expansion of the bead, as we talked about. And the density of EPS core material runs around one pound per cubic foot. A cubic foot of foam is going to weigh one pound. It's that density that has uh, uh, the change in that density which will change the R value. But for most manufacturers, they stay at one pound density. If you go into the XPS, you're seeing about 1.8 pounds per cubic foot. If we go to the polyurethane core, we're up to about 2.2, 2.3 pounds per cubic foot. So there's a weight difference between EPS, XPS, and polyurethane just as there's an R value difference. There's also a compressive strength difference. By the time you put a skin on the panel, the compressive strength really has very little to do with the performance characteristics of that panel. It's more about density. So you have to understand what those densities of those various types of foams are. The really neat thing about the way the SIP is manufactured and put together with skins on the outside and a solid foam core in the middle is that the assembly becomes what is known as bilaterally symmetrical. If moisture gets into the core, it can dry in either direction. It has that same ability to lose moisture or lose vapor in either direction. And this makes the SIP universally acceptable in almost any climate that you want to build in. Next, I'd like to talk about fire resistance. There's a lot of mis misinformation floating around about the fire resistance capabilities of structural insulated panels. And some of this has to do with the different types of foams that are used in them. It's absolutely true that polyurethane is a class one rated material in terms of fire. This means that it won't burn. It'll char. Howsomever, there are chemicals that are used in these materials that give it a resistance to fire. It causes this material to basically self-extinguish. But the real key to this whole fire resistance debate, if you will, isn't about how the material, the core material reacts, it's how the assembly reacts. Because if we're talking about code, if we're talking about testing, and how it performs in real world, we have to look at the entire assembly. Panels go through a series of tests, which are ASTM tests. These ASTM tests don't test the core material, they test the entire assembly. That means we have to put the wall up, we have to finish the wall with drywall, we have to do everything that the builder or that you as the builder would do in order to make this a finished assembly. And that's when ASTM testing comes into play and we start to look at things like one hour fire rating, two hour fire ratings. So it's really the assembly that we test. These tests are go, no go tests. In other words, does it pass the test? All three of these cores in any of the types of SIPs that we've talked about all meet the requirements of ASTM testing. So in terms of fire resistance, if we test the assembly and they all pass, then we all have basically a fire resistant material. Taking a core material out and suggesting that it melts or burns and therefore we can't build a house out of it would be similar to taking a woods and stud out of a wall assembly and showing that it actually burns and therefore we can't build houses out of wood. It's a, it's a fair comparison. You don't take a piece or a component out and suggest that it burns and therefore it doesn't work. You have to look at the entire assembly. 
The next thing we want to look at when we talk about the comparison of the three types of foams is available sizes and thicknesses. And this is important because, because, because it comes into play when we talk about design and design elements and which panels are thicker or larger. If we start with EPS, the EPS, as you remember, was manufactured in a large block. It's this large block that allows us to manufacture a panel of any thickness. The thickest panel typically being, as you probably know, three and a half inch core material. We can take that EPS and go all the way up to 11 and a quarter inch core. Makes for a very thick panel. And again, uh, when we're using that jumbo OSB skin, we have a very large panel that's very thick, can span great distances. Now the XPS, as I told you, is extruded board stock, and it has a maximum thickness that it can that it can be manufactured to. So if we want to go with a thicker panel, we have to use multiple layers of XPS material and more glue lines. Um, this doesn't affect us in any other way potentially other than to drive the cost up slightly because again we put an additional step in manufacturing in there. If we go with the polyurethane, we do have a real limitation. What's that limitation? It has to do with how thick we can allow that urethane foam to expand. In the industry today, you'll see that predominantly the two thicknesses that are available with a urethane core are going to be a three and a half inch core or a five and a half inch core. Now, the urethane manufacturers, they have the advantage of saying, we don't need to go any thicker because we meet all of the thermal requirements that are in play today. The code says we need to meet an R value and polyurethane having a very high R per inch allows you to get to those those numbers that you need in terms of thermal performance with a much thinner panel. But where that tends to be a disadvantage is when you have to span larger distance. If you have to span a larger distance and your panel thickness is only five and a half inch core, you may need to put additional support structures in there because the thickness of that panel has a limitation into how far it can span. So it's these different availabilities in terms of foam that come into play when you start thinking about designing and, and how far that particular core may be able to span or how thick it might be and how you get the thermal performance based on the thickness of that material. And the last thing I'll throw in here while we're talking about foam is the uh, often uh, brought up discussion of bug proof. How do foams react to the little kind critters known as termites and carpenter ants which we find in North America that wreak havoc on structures, typically wood structures, because to them they smell the cellulose and then when they find the foam they have the ability to burrow into that foam and have a nice comfortable easy place to burrow into and live very comfortably while they're waiting for their next meal. The EPS industry has developed borate infused material and it's this borate that provides some level of protection for the intrusion of either carpenter ants and termites. It's not the end-all be-all of termite protection, especially when you get into the deep south where it's such a, um, a, a huge problem for many of the wood structures down there. And that's when we start looking at potentially some other skins uh, that prevents them from being even attracted to that particular panel. But the EPS does have borates. And if you are using EPS core material, the, the decision to use borates is a good one if you're building an area where you have either carpenter ants or termites. Both polyurethane and XPS don't have the ability to infuse those borates into their foam material such that they have those resistances to carpenter ants and termites. Now let's, that we've talked about the foam cores, let's talk about the skins because again there's some misunderstandings and there's some advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons of working with the different types of skins. And the three types of skins that we're going to talk about are going to be OSB, metal, and cementaceous or the cement skins. First and foremost, let's talk about moisture because obviously if we're building an environment where we have a high moisture content and we have OSB, it's this OSB that if it gets wet and doesn't dry out, it becomes a problem. Moisture affects wood. Moisture affects OSB. It's something that you need to be concerned about and understand the detailing and how you're going to finish it so that we know that the wood has the ability to, one, stay dry and two, dry out if it gets wet. Now if we're talking about metal, moisture hardly affects metal at all. It hardly affects cement other than the fact that the cementaceous skins will absorb moisture and when they absorb moisture, they expand. There's an expansion contraction element 
to wetting of cement skins, just as there's, there's an expansion and contraction issue to OSB when it gets wet. So the moisture does affect two of these three types of skins. Next, let's talk about ease of assembly. We have three different types of material. Maybe it just depends on who the builder, who the carpenter is, which one they think is easiest to assemble. The reality is, is most carpenters are used to dealing with wood. They may think that actually putting up wood panels, wood skin panels, is going to be the easiest. Uh, they're used to assembling them with nails, nail guns. If you move into the metal or the cement skin, uh, the biggest difference really is the weight. One's lighter and one's much heavier. Also differences in sizes, of course. But when it comes to actual assembly, the metal and the cement, both are going to be uh, put together with screws. So for those people who move away from an OSB skin panel and start looking at metal or a cement skin panel, typically trade in their nail gun for a screw gun. That's really the only difference. Field modifications, however, might be a bigger issue. Field modifications, again, the carpenter who's used to dealing with wood would think, well, this is much easier. I have a saw, I know how to cut wood, I can make modifications on site, and that's pretty simple to do. In fact, with metal, it's pretty simple as well. The types of tooling that we have in the metal industry allows us to cut a metal skin panel without much difficulty at all. Uh, and we can make these types of modifications on the fly with no problem. Uh, if we start talking about a cement skin panel and we have to make those modifications, it's much more difficult. First of all, we're dealing with a lot more dust. We're dealing with a, a, a tooling that is not as easy to work with when we're talking about a cement skin panel. Finished materials. In some cases, the builder, the owner, the architect may want the skin to be a finished material. There's limitations when we talk about that. But if we're talking about all three different types of skins, with OSB being the one most commonly used, as a finished material, a lot of limitations. First of all, it doesn't necessarily look the way most people want it to look like. Two, it doesn't have that fire rating if it's not an assembly. In order to be an assembly, it has to be covered up. So it's not a finished material per se. In metal and cement, both of those could potentially be used as a finished material. In the metal industry, with the, uh, uh, the urethane core, you remember I said that it was used in the freezer or the walk-in cooler industry as a finished material. Cement could be a finished material, sometimes is viewed as that, with merely a stucco or a parging over top of it, and we've got a finished panel. The one thing you should really think about when talking about SIPs and whether or not the skin is a finished material is, do you want the structural nature of your panel to be exposed to the elements? What I'm saying here is you don't want to build a stick frame wall and have your studs exposed to the elements, exposed to moisture, to wind, to the potential damage that they may encounter over the life of the structure. The same is really too true about the skin of the panel. Do you want the skin of your panel exposed to mother nature, to the elements, to the abuses that the structure might see over the life of its, um, its useful service life? So for that reason, SIPs perform very well, but I'm always a big fan of making sure that we cover those SIPs up and put a real finished material on the outside. Next, let's look at the characteristic of fire. We talked extensively about fire when it came to core materials and how it has to act as an assembly. Well, the same is really true when we talk about the finished or the, uh, the skins of the various types of panels. OSB, it's wood. It burns. But again, as an assembly, not nearly an issue. Metal, uh, it doesn't burn, but what happens when it gets really hot? It loses its structural strength and it can sag um, and lose those physical properties. Cement, clear winner. When it comes to fire, if you're trying to build a panel that has actually has zero combustibility, using things like urethane cores and a cement skin, that give you complete resistance to fire. So it is the cement skin in this case that is the clear winner. Now let's talk about termites. We've gone from fire, let's move to termites. What is it that attracts a termite or even a carpenter ant to a structure in the first place? It's the cellulose. They smell cellulose like you and I smell a steak dinner. So when they're attracted to that structure, they want to eat it up when they find it. If we don't have any cellulose, we're not going to attract the critters to your structure. So in this case, both metal and a cement skin are clear winners in that area. And that's why we see them typically used further into the south. And we got dropped down into even Central America. That's where the cement skins are very, very popular. But we also have talked about size of the panel. 
And when it comes to the size of the panel, as I've said before, the OSB gives us that jumbo format. That's a nice thing to work with when we're talking 8x24. Fewer joints, quicker assembly, um, gives us some of those clear advantages. The metal has an advantage in one direction, but not the other. Remember, metal comes in coil stock, so now we have panels that are very, very long, but never really very wide. We typically max out with coil stock material coming in somewhere around 48 inches and by the time it's manufactured into a panel, it's mill folded, bent, or such that the finished panel is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 44, 45 inches wide. So that's the limitation of that. When it comes to cement, real disadvantage here is that the panel only comes in a size up to about 4 by 14. And the last thing we want to talk about when it comes to characteristics of these panels or the, the finished skins on these panels, is going to be the weight, because there's some big differences here. I'll start out with OSB because I have in, in previous issues. OSB has a weight that runs around four pounds per square foot of the panel. Now that goes up or down a little bit, again, depending upon the thickness of the panel. But just as a generic number, let's throw out four pounds per square foot. It's a pretty good average for most panel sizes. Four pounds per square foot, that means that a four by eight panel is weighing in close to about 100 pounds. You can pick that up as a, you know, a, a carpenter working out in the field. Now make that same size panel out of metal and it's going to weigh half as much. It's a whole lot lighter. This means that m working with a metal skin panel has some clear advantages in terms of weight. The opposite is true is when you go to the cement skin panel. You just doubled the weight. So now that 4x8 panel is weighing in at close to 200 pounds with cement skins on both sides. It's a very heavy panel and difficult to move around. It's going to slow you down a lot. So it's these weight issues that we have to take a look at when thinking about how are we setting panels, do we have equipment. Um, all of these various characteristics of these skins come into play when we start looking at the uh, what type of panel we want to design with, what we want to use, and what's available to us. So take all this information I've given you on the introduction of SIPs, and uh, let's make this the jump off point for the next nine hours where we're going to get into the real heart of how SIPs are used, designed, worked with, and installed, and we'll get through this program in another nine hours. Thanks so very much.